if you're still here, that was awesome, but I think we should clap for her again. I thought it was just great. Um, I like it because that's the kind of stuff that I try to figure out and try to follow. And, um, and I also love, um, you know, what I wanted to talk to you all about today primarily is um, incentives and how they work and how they fail, because that's really what I do with um, Freakonomics is try to understand incentives. Um, but I also love storytelling, which I thought Zoe did incredibly well. Um, and so I had planned to start with one thing, but I, I thought of something that might be um, a little bit different. So I, I, I won't tell you which I planned and which I might change to. So let me just, uh, we'll take a, a hand vote. Would you rather I start by talking about um, the Ten Commandments or turkey sex? So Ten Commandments, raise a hand. <laughs> Ten Commandments, wow, very unbiblical crowd. Turkey sex? Oh my God, you perverts. Okay, so, <laughs> so, this, so just so you know, this is what I was gonna start with. So just so you know, we do, we do share the same prurient interest. All I wanted to say about turkey sex is this. Um, turkeys don't really get to have sex very much. And I discovered this in my reading. So this is what I do. I don't have a job. I'm unemployable. I can't, I'm not good at meetings. I'm not good at hierarchies. I'm, I'm not good at following directions. That's why I became a writer. And so I don't have a job, and all I do every day, just so you can uh, know what to expect here for the next 40 minutes, this is how I spend my day. I live in New York City, I got a wife, a couple kids, a dog. I go to my office, which is a block and a half away, because I'm not only unemployable, but I'm lazy. And I sit in my office all day, and I just kind of read and think, and then if the reading and thinking go well, then I might find something to write about. That's really all I do for about 10, 11 hours. And, um, I like to read um, academic journals. Um, I like to hang out with economists, and I, I particularly like to read journals about agricultural economics, um, which I know you do too, because um, I grew up on a farm, and I, I just find it really interesting that we deliver food for seven billion people every day. It's really a remarkable accomplishment. And I was reading this, <laughs> this journal one day. I think it was the Journal of Agricultural Economics, because they give them really sexy titles. And, um, and, and the, the, the paper was about the rise in consumption in America of poultry versus red meat and pork. So it used to be pork was the number one meat for a long, long time. Then red meat caught up and took it over. And poultry had always lagged behind. But now poultry, turkey, and chicken combined are about the same as, um, as red meat, which is a big change. And in reading this, I, I came across one tiny little fact. It was half a sentence that just caught my eye. And, and if you're like me, this will happen to you. You'll, you'll see one fact or number or idea, and it will just, for whatever reason, capture your attention, and you want to find out more about it. And the, the sentence that caught my attention was it said that um, in this huge boom in uh, turkey consumption, one result of that was that almost all turkeys bred for consumption in the United States are the product of artificial insemination. So turkeys are, are not having sex at all. And uh, I thought, well, weird. I'd never thought once in my life about turkeys having sex. Maybe, maybe you had, I had not. And I, and I decided that it might be interesting to find out why. So what do you do when you find one number or statistic or fact that you know, seems out of context? You try to put it in context. So you go to the chicken data, right? You go to the chicken breeding data. And it turns out that chickens who are bred for consumption do have sex. They procreate nat rat uh, naturally. So I thought, what, what <laughs> poor turkeys, what, what? So first of all, it's a justice issue, right? Forget about the agricultural. <laughs> so here's the story, make a very long story short. Um, it turns out that, you know, as our, as our appetite for turkey has risen so much, in America particularly, we like the white meat of turkey, which comes from the breast. So what's happened is over the years, the turkey producers, ranchers, people who sell and distribute, had bred the birds to have larger and larger breasts. So it used to be that you would go into a supermarket like 50 years ago, and there'd be a turkey with a kind of scrawny breast. And then they changed birds, a different kind of breed, and then they began to breed them, like I said, to have larger and larger and larger breasts, to the point that now you go to like a turkey farm, and there's like Tom Turkey, with this big breast sticking out like this, and Jane, whatever her name is, and they come up, and whereas they used to, you know, kiss whatever the turkeys do, they literally, because their breasts are so large now, they literally cannot get close enough to physically procreate, thus the need for turkey artificial insemination, no turkey sex. I know, it's a 
tragedy, but this, <laughs> this is how I spend my day, people, okay? I wanted to, um, I just wanted to properly lower the expectations so you know what you're dealing with here. So I want to tell you what I can tell you, and I dearly hope it's of some help to you, but I'm not expecting it to be, okay? <clears throat> Unless you plan to quit your marketing jobs and go into turkey ranching. Um, but what I like about this story, and the reason that this kind of story appeals to me, um, is that it, it reflects the two things that I really care about, which are one, incentives, which is, again, in this case, it was the, the motivation, the appetite for consumers. They wanted more breast meat. What happened? The ranchers responded to those incentives. That's the way the world works. People respond to incentives to change the story that's happening. And the other part of the story that I like is that it's got data in it. Um, I'm a big believer that we all have ideas for how to fix a problem, for how to you know, help the world, for how to make ourselves happy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's good, ideas are great. Ideas are all, almost always the starting point. But without good data, and I mean good data, and I'm gonna talk in a moment about the difference between good data and crap data. Without good data, you're really just guessing. And I know that um, we're in a funny point right now in the world where we're being overwhelmed with data. Many of us love it, many of us don't like it. And I think it's very natural if you don't like it to push back and say, you know what? The data can't tell me how I feel, the, da the data can't tell me how I should behave and so on. And I would largely agree with you, but it can be a great tool if you learn how to really use it and understand what it actually represents. So that's what I wanted to start by talking about. So let me ask you this question, a, a, a little poll. Um, Raise your hand if you, after you use a public restroom, after you go to the bathroom in a public restroom, raise your hand if you do not afterwards wash your hands, if you don't wash your hands, okay? Let's, <laughs> let's hoist them high, let's see what we got. Wow, unbelievably hygienic group of people here. So um, here's the thing, I know you're a pretty honest group of people. Um, I don't know you personally, but I know you're honest kind of by proxy you're here at a conference, which means you do pretty well in your professional life. In America, you know, our, our system, both our democracy and our capitalism, they punish dishonesty pretty, pretty intensely, which is one thing we really like about our system. There are things we don't like. But um, by dint of your being here, I know you're a relatively honest person, even if I don't know you. So I, I know you're pretty honest. You do look to be uh, pretty hygienic, from what I can tell. But um, I know that a bunch of you, particularly the men, are lying to me right now, okay? And I know you're lying because we actually have data on this topic. The topic is called, the, the data, um, this falls under the purview of what's called public restroom hand hygiene compliance rate, okay? And uh, so you think, well, how do you get those data? You can't just go put cameras in public bathrooms, so what do you do? Well, okay, if you wanna get good data, real data, sometimes you have to be a little bit crafty. You have to be a little bit clever. So I'll tell you what I do. I travel a lot. I'm guessing many of you do as well. I always carry a handy dandy notebook, okay? If I need to use the, the if I get, get off a flight, I need to use the bathroom in the airport, I do. Then at the sink, I go wash my hands. And at the sink, I'll just kind of linger for a while with my notebook. <laughs> Simple as this. All you gotta do, I'm writing down the number of men who are coming out of a stall or a urinal. I haven't done it in a ladies room yet, but the number of men, <laughs> I see the number of them that are washing their hands. That's data, right, okay? Now, um, if you find this uh, data collection uh, exciting, uh, I encourage you to give it a try. Um, do not try it in the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport, where you may remember a certain US senator was doing a whole different kind of um, data collection in a stall, that will get you arrested. This won't, what I do. But here's what I find. I find that on average, about seven out of 10 men who get off a plane and use a bathroom in a US airport wash their hands and the other 30% go right by without washing. Now, what, what does this say about the non-washers? Maybe we don't care about them. Maybe that's, that's not my point at the moment. My point is this, if you brought the non-washers into this room and sat them with their friends, maybe clients, colleagues, bosses, whatever, they're not gonna raise their hands either, right? The circumstances under which a question is asked, or more broadly, more importantly, for the work that you do and for the work that I do, the circumstances under which the data are gathered have a great deal to do with how reliable those data are. Now, we know that intellectually, 
but we're also very, very good at using parts of the brain, maybe the alligator parts that Zoe was talking about. We're really, really good at seeking out evidence that confirms what we want to be true or that confirms a decision we've already made, and we're really good at ignoring evidence that contradicts what we want to be true or the, the decision that we've already made. And so it's really important to distinguish between what the data really say and what, like you guys told me, 30% of you men were probably roughly lying to me, right? So this is what economists call the difference between declared preferences and revealed preferences. And I think there is no more important realm or industry in which this difference matters than yours. Because you can ask people, you can ask customers, you can ask potential customers, you can ask former customers or fill in instead of customers, clients, whatever, patients in a hospital, whatever you want. You can ask them any kind of question and they will give you an answer. But there's a ton of good social science research that shows that that kind of um, self-reported data, declared preferences, is close to worthless. Why? There are a million reasons why. People have a different view of themselves than reality. People want to be different than they really are. People want to please you. You're the authority figure who's asking the questions. They know kind of what, they, what you want them to say, and so they like to be pleasers. Plus which, you've got a huge you know, sample bias in the start, which is the kind of people that typically do those kinds of surveys and studies are what you'd call cooperators to start with. They're the cooperative people. So their answers just don't reflect the way the real world will work. And if you want to fix something or improve something or win something or sell something in the real world, you need to know not what people are telling you they will do or even what they have done, but, what, but, but you need to get data that shows what they actually do. So that's why I go hang out in airport restrooms. Now, there are people who care about the topic of hand hygiene who do it a little bit more scientifically than me, fortunately. And there is a lot of data on this. So I'll give you, here's, a, here's a, um, another for instance with real data. There was a study done in an Australian children's hospital uh, some years back. And they asked a bunch of doctors to report to the researchers. Researchers would sit there with clipboards. They asked the doctors to come and report at the end of every day their hand hygiene compliance rate, which is basically, essentially you're supposed to wash your hands before and after every patient contact, okay? So over the course of, I think it was uh, 11 weeks, the doctor's self-reported hand hygiene rate was 73%. Okay, so that's just one piece of data. That's just like seeing turkeys, artificial insemination. We don't really know what it means yet. It's just one piece of data. So what does it mean? Well, let's try to put it in context. You could say, well, it's not very good. It should be 100%. Or you could say, well, you know, considering that, okay, considering that you all told me that you were 100% hand hygiene compliant, and I know that you're more like 70 so you lie roughly 30%, right? I could say, look, maybe the doctors uh, aren't washing 100% of the times, but at least they're honest, right? Maybe that's another way to interpret the data. How do we know? Well, how you know is by using that self-reported data as one point of data to look at, but then let's get some other data. How do you do that? Again, crafty, clever. The researchers who ran this um, study did a, a super, super simple, but super smart thing which is they deputized nurses in the hospital to spy on the doctors. So literally, every time a doctor would walk into a patient's room to, to see the patient, the nurse would kind of come in behind, or maybe they were there ahead of time, and they would watch, or if they were outside, they'd listen for the sink or the, anti, uh, for the disinfectant pump, and they would simply record, like me, whether the doc is actually washing or disinfecting hands. So it turns out, that over the same exact period of time that these same exact doctors reported a 73% hand hygiene rate, the real rate discovered by the nurses was actually 9%, okay? So forget about how bad that is. I mean, really bad and scary and you could argue immoral, right? Forget about all that. Here's the thing, from your perspective, if you are the one who's trying to solve the problem, well, the difference between when three out of four people say they do something or will do something, and when one out of 10 actually does, it's, now it's not just a magnitude problem. Now it's a different kind of problem entirely. So if you wanna solve the real problem, the first step is to get the real data. Not only to see how bad it is or how good it is, but to see you know, exactly what the problem is, which is that people aren't washing their hands, okay? So what do you do? If that's the behavior you're trying to change, how do you influence that? 
So this is a problem that, weirdly enough, hospitals have been struggling with for like 150 years, since the discovery that hand hygiene was actually a really good idea. Some of the best hospitals in the world struggle with it. Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, one of the best hospitals in the world on any dimension you can think of. Um, they discovered by deputizing their nurses to spy on their doctors that the hand hygiene rate at Cedar sinai was about 60%. Pathetic. And these are some of the best, most highly paid doctors in the world. So Cedars thought, all right, what, what can we do to engage the doctors, you know, let them know we're on the same team, we don't want to, you know, scold them. What can we do to, like, get, get the rate to 100? So they did what, um, what people do often in, uh, in the Western world, particularly in, um, in America, particularly in corporate America, when you have a problem that you're really, really serious about and you want to send a signal that you're really serious, they formed a committee, all right? <laughs> they formed a committee which would tell everybody, hey, this is really serious. And this was called the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center Chief of Staff Hand Hygiene Advisory Committee. It's like, Chichisahing for short, okay? <laughs> labeling, okay, Zoe's labeling. This is bad labeling. First of all, the task force name is too long for anybody to actually pronounce it, but <clears throat> they wanted to indicate that they took it seriously enough to form a committee and a task force. So they got together, and this was like 30 of the top officials in the hospital, most of whom were medical doctors themselves. They know the science, they know the behavior. They get together and they think, okay, we need to communicate this is not a problem of education. The doctors know the science. This is a problem of communication. So what do we do? How do we communicate clearly our intention and our you know, desire for them to comply? And they thought, let's issue a memo because we know how everyone reads every memo forever and does exactly what every memo ever says, right? Has anybody ever actually, I mean, I've written memos. I, I just assume they'll be ignored. So, but anyway, they decided, we're going to issue a memo, and, and they thought about it, and they thought, again, we want to make them on our team, we don't want to antagonize them. So they said, um, you know, we, we fully appreciate and anticipate your participation in getting to 100% hand hygiene compliance to make Cedar sinai world class in hand hygiene compliance just as it is on other, other dimensions. So basically it was kind of like a, a nice, nice, smart form of flattery. And they distributed the memo, and they had the nurses watching the doctors, and they sat back, and now they just waited for the needle to move up to 100%, and the needle did not move at all, right? Zero, zero. zero. The memo was totally, totally ignored. So then they thought, all right, we need to come up with something else. Um, what if, they thought, what if we take our message to the wards, to the patients' rooms, where the doctors are actually doing their medicine, because that's where this happens, right? And, the, and they came up with this idea where they would break the big committee into smaller groups that was now called the, um, the Posse Patrol Program Subcommittee of the Cedar sinai Medical Center Chief of Staff Hand Hygiene Advisory Committee. So this is like Chichisahing Triple P, the Posse Patrol Program. And here's the way this would work. The Posse Patrol Program would take one or two or three of the committee members at a time, breaking up in little posses, and they'd go into different wings of the hospital when the patients were, when the doctors were expected to make their rounds, and they would go in patients' rooms and hide and wait for the doctors to come in. So here was their original plan. The original plan is we're gonna hide and wait, and when a doctor comes in and fails to wash, we're gonna come out, jump out, and like scold them. <laughs> and take their name and publicly post it and make them feel like crap, and that'll be great. That was their original plan. Then they thought about that for like five minutes. They said, uh, maybe, you know, they're not going to like that. They're not going like, <laughs> to like the public shaming. And again, the, the dynamic of this place, let me, let, me say, let me back up and say one thing. Any incentive that I talk about today, any incentive that anybody ever talks about is extremely context-specific, okay? It's really important to know that ex if something works perfectly, even in one hospital, there's no guarantee it'll work perfectly in another hospital because cultures are different, people are different, light is different, our physical surroundings, our cognitive uh, reaction to those surroundings, there are a lot of variables. So that's an important caveat to know. But they decided that in this case, 
Cedar sinai the administration, they're the bosses, but the doctors are really the stars of the system, and they are freelancers, essentially. So if they felt antagonized, they could just go to another hospital, and Cedar sinai did not want to take that chance. They thought, okay, whoa, rather than the public shaming, let's try the Posse Patrol program, but instead of the negative incentive of scolding and shaming, let's try a positive incentive, right? So again, whenever you're trying to come up with an incentive, you gotta realize there are many uh, flavors. There are financial incentives, of course. There are you know, social incentives and moral incentives. One incentive that people care about a lot these days are our public, our social media reputations. People really care. I mean, half the world now broadcasts, maybe in a small way, maybe it's narrow casting, but half the world puts out to the world like what they're doing. Why do they do that? They put it out for some kind of approval. We all wanna be liked, we all wanna be approved, right? <clears throat> and so it can be very harsh to get spanked publicly, you know, privately as well. And so we spend a lot of time worrying about our, our reputations. And so the incentives to be seen as a good person are really, really strong and things like that. So there are all different kinds of incentives that you can create. Additionally, like I said, there, there are negative and positive incentives, right? Carrot and sticks. They thought about the stick. They thought about the shaming. Now instead they're going to go for the carrot. And here's what they came up with. Here is the plan. Posse patrol program, they go in the wings when the patient, when the, excuse me, doctors are getting ready to come around on their rounds. They hide in the room. They would hide behind like a wall or a curtain or maybe a big piece of equipment. Sometimes they'd have to crouch down. And when they'd hear the doc walk in, and if they'd hear the water turn on, they'd jump out and then they clap for the doctor, okay? And then they'd give them a $10 Starbucks card as a reward for washing their hands, all right? So when the chief of staff of the hospital told me this story, I said, um, you know, um, I mean, no offense by this, you are way smarter than I'll ever be. This guy was a, a great surgeon, a, a great doctor, a great administrator. I said, you're way smarter than I'll ever be, but that idea just sounds so stupid <laughs> that, you, that you are trying to change the behavior. You're trying to incentivize the highest earners in your hospital. These docs are earning between four and $600,000 a year. You're trying to change the behavior of those people with $10 worth of free coffee? Come on, that's just idiotic. Uh, so I learned a really great lesson that day. I was wrong. And the lesson that I learned is never underestimate the power of free, okay? Because it does not matter how much of anything someone's got, how much they're worth, if you offer them some free stuff, the alligator part of our brain, to quote Zoe, will just zap at it. Like, uh, not like the alligators who are too lazy to eat a hot dog, but you ever see a lizard sitting in the sun and like the fly comes by? They don't even have to think about it. They just zap it with their tongue. That's the way we are with free stuff. So listen, I don't mean to insult anyone, although I'm about to. I, I shouldn't say I don't mean to. Let me insult someone here. Um, <laughs> at a conference like this, I'd be shocked if they're not giving out a bunch of free stuff. There are go bags, goodie bags. I know there's a trade floor. There's all kinds of free stuff. So let me say this. Most of it is total garbage, and yet you're gonna love getting it, and you can't wait to line up for it. For one simple reason, which is it's free. Now, you can look at that a number of ways. You could say, you know, the moralist in you could say, oh, it's terrible people are such consumers, da da da, that makes us bad, we shouldn't want as much stuff as we do. Or you can say, if that's the way the human brain works, let's find a way to take advantage of that and exploit it for the good. Okay, to exploit it to get doctors to wash their hands, for instance. So as it turns out, at Cedar sinai the doctors loved getting the free Starbucks cards. They loved it so much that not a single doctor ever said, oh, chief of staff of hospital, um, thank you so much, but why don't you take the $10 and use it for something else or someone else? Not a single one ever turned down a card. Furthermore, they began to game the system. So when they would hear that the posse was on their floor, they'd run up and start washing their hands like in all the rooms trying to get the card, okay? <laughs> so that was great. It took literally a life and death problem and turned it into a game that people wanted to play, which was awesome. Just one problem, which is it didn't work. The card didn't overall raise the rate of hand hygiene at the hospital. Why? So here's the tricky part. When you use data to try to understand incentives, you can get at the what pretty easily. The what is it didn't work. 
the what is they wanted it, they took it, but it didn't produce the behavior you wanted. The why, the why is complicated. The why gets into psychology, might get into religion, who, who knows, it gets into a lot of things. One answer may be that if I get the card when I see my patient in room 504, and I ran into the posse there, and then I have a patient in 501, I know the posse's not there, and I'm not getting another card. And I probably fell behind in my routine from chatting with the posse in 504, so maybe I skipped hand washing in 501. Maybe unconsciously, maybe subconsciously even. But for whatever reason, the card, as much as they loved it, didn't work. So now, the poor committee is stuck with, you know, they've spent all this money on Starbucks cards, they issued the memo that nobody read, and they still haven't solved the problem. And this is when someone in the room uh, came up with an idea. Interestingly, she was uh, the, one of the quiet people on the committee who rarely spoke up publicly. And um, whenever I think about her, she was the staff epidemiologist. Whenever I think about her, I think about how often we give um, our ears to the noisy people. I mean, I mean, you're hearing me talk now. Obviously, I've become a noisy person, but for many years, I was the person who just sat back and was kind of too shy or timid to voice an idea. But you realize that the way that our corporate culture works, especially, especially meeting culture, if you're noisy, you get a lot of attention, a lot of your ideas get considered and maybe praised. And often the quiet people don't even get a, literally get a voice at the meeting. So I think about that. I think it'd be nice if we could try to change that. I think whoever's running the meeting can really help change that by literally doing something as simple as, you know, halfway through the meeting, if there's someone you haven't heard from yet, say, you know, you know, whoever, I haven't, you know, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that or I haven't heard from you yet. I'm curious what your thoughts are because it's really important to get the best ideas, not just the ideas from the noisy people. So anyway, it took until they were pretty desperate for this quiet person to speak up and she said, um, I have an idea that won't, it's not really a solution to the problem we're talking about, but it might help us think about it a little bit differently. She said, I hope it doesn't upset anyone, but, and she pulled out this bag with um, a bunch of Petri dishes in it, with agar plates, the kind of thing used in, in high school biology to, to, take a, to, to take a sample of something and culture it in the lab. And she said, you know, here we are, the bosses of the hospital, telling everyone else how badly they're failing, but what about us? Are our hands clean, literally? Are our hands free of the bacteria that we need to be getting rid of to keep our patients safe? And she asked everybody at the, in the committee to lay their palms in the um, Petri dishes, and she wrapped them up, and um, she sent them to the lab for culturing, and she anonymized them. She wasn't trying to embarrass anyone um, by identity. And when she had them cultured, she found that the vast majority of the hands that belonged to the committee were covered with the very bacteria <clears throat> that they'd been yelling at everybody else about for not getting rid of. And this was a really sobering moment for them. They realized, you know, here we are not only not fixing the problem, but we're contributing to it. And they thought, you know, is there some way that we could take this idea, is it data? I don't know if you want to call it data, it's kind of data, and turn it into a different kind of motivation or incentive to get people to behave how we want. And that's when the chief of staff came up with this idea that finally turned out to be a brilliant winning idea, which is he said, what if we take a photograph of one of these Petri dishes, and if you look at it, it's, if you're a doctor or a nurse and you look at it, it's a scary sight. It's basically a hand-shaped uh, uh, conglomeration of scary bacteria, right? And you just look at it and you can sense what it is. He said, what if we take a picture of one of these, uh, let it be known that it belonged to one of us, the bosses who are trying and failing to fix this problem and make it the screensaver on every computer in the hospital. And they did it and virtually overnight the hand hygiene compliance at Cedar sinai shot up to 100%. Um, why did it work? It's a little bit hard to say why it worked. It may have just been something as simple as, you know, if you're a doctor and you're walking down the hall and you see image after image after image and you go in the patient's room and you see the image, you can't help but reflexively wash your hands. Maybe that's why it worked. Whatever the reason was, it did work after all that trial and error. It worked so well that other hospitals began to write and call Cedar sinai and say, hey, can you send us a picture of those bacteria? Because like, we don't have those bacteria in our hospital, of course. <laughs> right, the great delusion of it, right? So this would seem to be um, you know, a happy ending story 
about using data and understanding incentives to produce behavior that we want. And it is, but it's also a story about failure. Look how long it took to get motivated, educated people to do the behavior that they have known since medical school that they should be doing. You know, behavior, behavior is heavily influenced by incentives, but incentives are tricky to figure out. And incentives, as I said before, are context dependent and incentives shift over time. You have to constantly be vigilant and the way you're vigilant is by constantly monitoring data to see how you're doing. Incentives work great unless they don't. Incentives work great until they wear out. Incentives work great unless maybe even they backfire. So governments in particular are really good at coming up with incentives that on paper look brilliant. You know, if we, like if we have this new law or this new uh, you know, motivation for people to do something and we just set it free, everybody's just gonna do it the way we would. But here's the problem with that. The people who create the incentive schemes in their business, whether internally or externally, people like you, you think that everybody will, will respond to the incentives the way you would. Meaning you're a disciplined person, you follow instructions, you're a cooperator. Not everybody's like that. The population is heterogeneous. So people sometimes, especially to government incentives, respond exactly the opposite of the way that it was intended. My favorite example of this comes from South Africa. In Johannesburg, there's a township called Alexandra. And Alexandra had this problem, very typical problem. A lot of cities throughout history, they had a lot of rats running around. And uh, they thought, well, how can we enlist the citizenry to help us get rid of the rats? They thought, well, what if we come up with like, you know, some incentives to help them help themselves? Free extermination they offered. And that was a pain in the neck. Nobody signed up for it. You had to be home. It, nobody wanted that. And then they said, well, how about free new trash cans with really tight-fitting lids that the rats can't get into? And again, people weren't very enthusiastic about that. And then they came up with an idea that um, an economist would love because it involved a financial incentive. And it was, it was basically... It was a bounty. <clears throat> it basically said to people, um, if you catch a rat and kill it and bring it to City Hall, we'll give you money. So it's literally a bounty on rodent carcasses. So what could possibly go wrong with that idea, right? It was the equivalent of about four US dollars. So they put this plan into place and immediately the people of Alexandria just rushed to take advantage of this new incentive. But not exactly as the city um, planners had intended. Instead, it gave rise to a whole new industry, which was rat farming. So people began to buy, breed, grow, and slaughter rats to turn them in to City Hall to get their, their, their new money. So the next time that you're designing an incentive plan that you're sure is like so brilliant on paper, it might be, but you should really try it out a lot and experiment a lot because instead you may end up with a pile of dead rats on your doorstep. It's not so easy to get the behavior you want for all the reasons I've been saying. Not everybody thinks like you. People respond to one incentive. You know, people have private incentives and public incentives. Um, what you gotta do is try to get data and sometimes you gotta get really small data and sometimes small weird data from which you can generalize to learn more about the bigger problem you're going to solve. So I have just a few minutes left. I want to tell you one more story about a hero of mine. I mean, not a hero. That's maybe overstating a little bit. But um, no, maybe a hero. And um, I love him because he, had, he has a kind of courage that I wouldn't, don't have, that I wouldn't have had in his case, a kind of curiosity that I really aspire to, and a kind of follow-through stick to to actually get this project done. And the project was a research project, and the guy that I'm talking about is a fellow named Keith Chen, who was a young, um, untenured professor at Yale, the Yale School of Management, when our story begins. And he showed up, and what you do, <clears throat> you're a young, untenured econ professor, your goal is to get tenure. How do you get tenure? You, basically, you come up with a research question that you're gonna answer so well and write a bunch of papers in great journals that your peers and elders will read and say, we need to keep this guy around, he's really valuable. So here was Keith Chen's um, research question. He thought, you know, we're economists, we should know everything about how people think about money, right? 
Isn't that like the one thing we should know, how they think about spending and saving and buying and stealing and giving charity, all this stuff. We should know all that. And yet we know very, very, very little. Why? It's because if you ask people about it, they tell you one thing, but we know that they often do something different. And because of privacy being what it is, it's hard to get the data to really answer the question. So Keith Chen thought, what if I could set up an experimental economy where I could watch and record every dollar spent where it's used for buying, stealing, spending, saving, whatever. Then he got to think about it a little bit more. He thought, well, if you know a little bit about social science, you know that when you create an experiment like that, that people start to respond artificially because it's an experiment. They want to please the experimenter. They don't want to be seen as greedy, all this. So he thought, what if instead then, in this experimental economy, I leave out the people and instead I use monkeys? who are kind of like people, right? So he thought, what if, this is Keith Chen's deep research question at Yale, what if I set up an experimental monkey economy and then write down how they spend and save their every dollar? Wouldn't that be awesome, he thought. That was Keith Chen's motivating question. So like I said, more courageous than I would be, more curious, and now he's got to get it done. And he does get it done. He sets up this lab at Yale New Haven Hospital <clears throat> and the way it works is this. Um, he recruited, I don't know how you recruit, I guess he bought monkeys is what happens actually. He got a bunch of monkeys and there would be seven monkeys living in a big cage. So let's see. Um, I'd say the whole thing was about, maybe from like about here down to the end of this rise that I'm standing on was this, this cage where seven monkeys would live. And then down here, there'd be a little door where one monkey at a time could come through into this smaller cage, much smaller cage, and do some experiments with money. Now that was not what he originally planned. What he originally planned was just like one big cage, wide open, like a store where he's selling stuff and a bank and all this stuff. But the veterinarians and the people who had to approve this as an academic research project, they would not let him give the monkeys money in an uncontrolled setting, just on their own, because they argued that that would um, pollute the monkey's natural culture that it would change them too much. And so he wasn't allowed to do that. So the compromise was that he had a little experimental cage here and then the big communal cage where they lived. But you know, it was a compromise, but he took what he could get. The monkeys that he chose to use are the capuchin monkey, which are these really great little guys. They're like, um, they're about the size of like a very scrawny one-year-old human with a tail the length of their body, okay? And um, the important things to know about the capuchin monkey are a couple things. One is they love sweet food. Any kind of sweet food you have, they're going to love it. And the other thing to know is that they're not very smart at all. They have a really small and very rudimentary brain, which, by the way, is exactly, <clears throat> excuse me, it's exactly why Keith Chen wants to use these monkeys. He doesn't want to see what, like, a super smart monkey can learn to do with money the way we would and then kind of deceive the researcher. <clears throat> he wants to see what the monkey brain is hardwired to do. And if there are any parallels then between them and us, then he's gonna have a whole lot of really good research papers to write, okay? He, he had no idea if there would be. He had no idea if he could even get them to learn to use money, but that was, that was the dream. So the capuchin monkeys, they love sweet food and they um, have a small and rudimentary brain. They're not even really thought to think the way we think about thinking. They're just thought to react. If they did think at all, it would be just about two things. Uh, one, I mentioned sweet food, and two, sex. So they're, which doesn't make them all that different from a lot of people that you and I both know, right? Those are their two central obsessions. And now he wants to give them a third obsession, which is money. So how, how do you teach a tiny-brained, food and sex crazed um, capuchin monkey to use money? So here's the way Keith Chen would do it. Seven monkeys living in here. He named them, by the way, after uh, characters in James Bond films. That's just something that monkey labs like to do. They give them all a certain kind of name. So there was like a Goldfinger monkey and a 007. And the one that became his favorite was called Felix, after Felix Leiter, the CIA agent. So here's the way it worked. You'd bring Felix from the big cage here into the little cage here, and you'd give him a coin. And he'd sniff it and try to eat it. And when he'd see that it's not edible, he'd get rid of it. And he'd get really angry if you did that repeatedly. So then you'd give Felix the coin and then offer some sweet food and Felix would take the food and then you would take the coin out of his other hand. And if you do this repeatedly, they'll learn that the coin has value. But like I said, 
The monkeys aren't very smart. It took six months, <laughs> on average, to teach the seven monkeys that if you give a coin, you get food in return. But finally, after all this repetition, they were able to do that. So now that he's got them using money kind of in a way that we recognize, he sets up an experiment, and what he wants to do now is very simple, very elegant. <clears throat> he wants to see, can a tiny-brained capuchin monkey consistently express its preferences for food with money? Because that's what we humans do. We consistently express our preferences for everything with money. I may say, I love the opera, if I want to impress you, if I think you love the opera. But if you can see that I've spent $100 on the opera in the last 10 years and $5,000 on video games, you'll know I express my preferences with money. So the way this will work for the monkeys is this. He'll bring the monkeys in one at a time, and they're going to do these hundreds of experiments where they're offering them all different kinds of food every day. And, and the monkey will have money, and they'll see if they buy the same food over and over again, all the food is priced the same. Do they have consistent preferences with food, and can they express it with money? And he's thinking, probably not, but he's praying that the answer is yes. So what, comes, what happens is Felix comes in, they give him some money, he starts to buy food, the researchers are holding it on either side of the cage, and it turns out that Felix loves jello cubes. So whenever there's jello for sale, Felix will always buy it. Um, but there's all these other kinds of food. There's apple slices and grapes, but whenever there's jello, Felix will always buy it. And so the other monkeys, too, similarly, whenever they found a food that they liked most, they would consistently buy that food. So now Keith Chen is thinking, well, this is awesome, because they, like us, consistently express their preferences um, with money, which is great, and that's going to lead to some, some real good work for me. But now, knowing that that is working, he wants to um, mess with the monkeys a little bit, and <laughs> And he, um, he decides to introduce into the monkey economy price shocks and wealth shocks. So what he's going to do now is taking, now that he knows every monkey's favorite food, he doubles the price of that food and that food only to see what happens. So he's thinking, well, they're tiny brain monkeys. They're probably just going to keep on buying that food even though they get way less of it because they're too stupid. They wouldn't do what we did. What we would do, what we would do is we would buy less of it. But as it turns out, that's exactly what the monkeys did. So when the jello doubled in price, Felix started to buy much less of that, and the other monkeys too with their favorite foods, and buy more of the food, uh, of the food that was now much cheaper that they liked less. So now Keith Chen is thinking, this is awesome. I mean, I'm going to get tenure somewhere, if not Yale. I'm going to get tenure because the parallels between the monkeys and us are strong enough and I'm going to be able to keep doing this research to write all these papers, and it's going to work out great. Good for the monkeys, really good for me. And if you ever needed further evidence of the parallels between the monkeys and us, he got it one day in the lab when something really strange happened that no one, um, no one would have ever seen coming. It was a day just like any other. All the monkeys are in here. They're bringing the monkeys one at a time into the little cage. Felix comes down in here, and by now they would usually give each monkey a basket with 12 coins, and the monkey would gather up the coins and start to buy the food. But on this day, for whatever reason, instead of gathering up the 12 coins and spending them, Felix, uh, Felix the monkey, takes the basket of 12 coins and flings them into the big cage over here, then runs in after them. So it's like a, a bank heist over here, followed by a jailbreak into the big cage, right? And now in the big cage, imagine the chaos that's in there. Seven monkeys, 12 coins on the floor, and the monkeys go for the money because they've learned that the money is worth having. So Keith Chen runs in to get the money back because remember, he's not allowed to let the monkeys have money in there. He's afraid he's going to get shut down. So he goes in, and the monkeys won't give him the money back because they're like, well, this is worth something now. So now he goes out and gets the big buckets of food to bribe them with it. And now the monkeys are thinking, oh, whenever possible, we should steal money from this man because now like, they're getting big buckets, big handful, like the exchange rate for one coin is huge. They're getting a big handful, right? And out of the corner of his eye, Keith Chen sees one monkey who's still got a coin and hops over to another monkey and just gives it to the other monkey. And now he's thinking, whoa, what's that that I'm seeing? Is it is it monkey altruism? Uh, you know, maybe that's another paper. Is it the repayment of a monkey loan? What's going on here? <laughs> Neither of those. Couple seconds of grooming, and then, bam. It was monkey sex. 
It was the first recorded instance of monkey prostitution in the history <laughs> of science, okay? And I, I mean, this is all real, not making any, I wish I were, okay? And, um, and then just to show how thoroughly the monkeys understand, I mean, talk about expressing your preferences with money. After the sex was over, the monkey who'd gotten the coin for sex hops over to Keith Chen to grab a big handful of grapes for it. I'm sure if there'd been a cigarette machine in the cage, it would have gone for that instead. So um, that concludes whatever just happened here. I thank you very, I tried to warn you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>